Welcome everyone. My name is Christina Straub and I'm hosting this collaboration between CMU's Center for the Arts and Society and the R18 Collective. I wanna begin by acknowledging the place of the center on the ancestral lands of the Haudenosaunee, the Lenape, the Osage and the Shawnee peoples. It is a huge pleasure to introduce the theater makers and the scholars who are going to lead us through first a discussion and then scene work from Elizabeth Inchbald's farce, Animal Magnetism. This event is actually a teaser for the full performance of Animal Magnetism by a star-studded cast of actors directed by CMU alum, Jose Zayas, and produced online by our friends at Red Bull Theater, coming to a Zoom room near you on January 23rd of 2023. Um, I wanna, mention that my R18 colleague, um, David Taylor, cannot be here today because of scheduling conflicts uh, with his duties at the University of Oxford. But I urge you to check out Red Bull Theater's website for his program notes on the play, which are excellent. And we have two scholars here with us who have, believe me, more than enough to say about Inchbald and her play. After we have had our scholars uh, speak and uh, rehearsed and run the scene. Most importantly, we hope to hear responses from you, our Zoom audience, for a rousing session of crowdsourced dramaturgy. I'm going to start by introducing Misty Anderson, uh, who is my fellow R18 colleague. And I'm hoping she is there. Yes, there she is. Hi, Misty. Uh, Misty is the James R. Cox professor and head of English at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where she holds courtesy appointments in theater and religious studies. And I wanna apologize for reading from my notes here. The accomplishments of our team here today are many and complex. Um, Anderson is the author of Imagining Methodism in 18th Century Britain, a much more theatrical subject than you could ever imagine. Uh, she is also the author of Female Playwrights in 18th Century Comedy and numerous articles on performance and gender in the long 18th century. She is co-editor of the Rutledge Anthology of Restoration in 18th Century Drama and the Rutledge Anthology of Restoration in 18th Century Performance, along with R18 collective members Daniel O'Quinn and myself. That took a few years of our life. Um, she has worked as a dramaturg for the Clarence Brown Theater and has produced a documentary about their 2017 production of The Busybody. She is currently completing a third book, God on Stage. It's also my pleasure to introduce Paula Backscheider. Paula is the Phil Pott Stevens Eminent Scholar Chair at Auburn University. Are you there, Paula? There you are. Yes, I was electronically taken away. Well, we're glad you're here now. Her Thank most you. recent book, Women in Wartime, Theatrical Representation in the Long 18th Century, was a finalist for the Bernard Hewitt Prize for Outstanding Theater Research. She's the author of several other books, including Spectacular Politics, Theatrical Power, and Mass Culture, and Daniel Defoe, His Life, which won the British Council Prize. 18th Century Women Poets and Their Poetry, which won the MLA James Russell Lowe Prize, and she has held ACLS, NEH, and Guggenheim Fellowships. Fellowships. Last but not least is our director, Tatiana Bakari. She is a queer, Jewish, and chronically ill director, producer, and artistic director. She says she is thrilled to be working with the R18 Collective. Thank you, Tatiana. We are very thrilled to be working with you. Uh, as artistic director of Experimental Bitch, Tatiana creates badly behaved new performance with emerging TGNC and women artists. This has included collaborations with artists and companies like Nia O. Witherspoon, Here Art Center, Diana O., The Bushwick Star, and Sam of the Theater. Tatiana was a 2020-21 Creative Pinellas Emerging Artist, where she directed a site-specific production of Everybody by Brandon Jacobs Jenkins in Clearwater, Florida. They were part of the 2019-2020-21 SDCF obs Observership class, where they assisted Piron Youssef Seda on Viet Gong by Ki Wen Gu Yen, 
at Jiva Theater Center. Her New York City directing credits include Petrified by Emma Goldman Sherman, The Chain Theater, Hamlet, She NYC Fest, The Connolly Theater, Trash Lord, Domestication by Sophia Heineke, The Performance Project at University Settlement, and Macbeth, No Name Collective at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Tatiana has a BFA from Tisch and is currently a John Wells MFA Directing Fellow at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, Tatiana will be introducing our fabulous um, cast of actors when we get to that part of our program today. But right now I can say, Misty, this is your cue. Christina, thank you so much. I can't tell you all what a joy it is to get to work with Christina on this project. Um, and I wanted to say just a word about what the R18 Collective is and what it aspires to be. Um, this is a project that was born on the deck outside of the Royal Shakespeare Company in the summer of 2019, which was the summer that had the double bill season of Venice Preserved and the Provoked Wife. And the three of us who were there as scholars, um, so thrilled to have a chance to see not one, but two restoration plays in a single season, um, realized that we had very few opportunities to do what Joseph Roach has called the scholarship of performance um, about the plays that we study. So we made a commitment there to do whatever we could to bring together theater makers and scholars so that we can discover together the long histories of gender, race, nation, capital, sexuality, and power that we find in these plays, both because we want to understand them as performances and because we believe that those performances can both reach contemporary audiences and teach us things about how we got here. Um, so to those of you who are in the audience um, this afternoon, who have also been a part of either our Oxford Symposium on Elizabeth Inchbald or our recent um, symposium at the Newberry Library, thank you. Um, and thank you for helping us embody this idea of a collective. So um, among those plays that we believe need to be on the stage are many, a significant archive of plays by women. We believe that they're performance ready and that they will speak to audiences. Animal magnetism is one of those plays. Um, so uh, at the risk of overviewing what my scholarly colleagues in the audience know um, very well, I just wanted to uh, emphasize, especially, uh, especially for actors and theater makers, how significant a role women played in Anglophone theater history. And that role is still being discovered. Some of you may have seen that just this past Sunday, The Guardian ran a feature on Lucy Monroe and Claire McManus's research on the female investors who were the driving force behind the Fortune Theater, which was the Renaissance rival to the globe where Marlowe and Middleton reigned. Women's influence on Anglophone theater explodes after 1660. Uh, the dawn of women acting professionally on the stage in England uh, led quickly to the rise of the first professional female playwrights. And so any idea that women were invisible is really a latent Victorian fantasy. Female playwrights wrote 33% of the offerings in the 1695-96 season. That was a high watermark, but for most of the 18th century, it was close to 10% of the offerings on the stage, certainly through the mid-1790s. Overall, that's actually a little bit better than women did in the 1980s and 90s. Female playwrights had their greatest successes in comedy, and that tends to depend on marriage plots. But we can also track a strong interest in pseudoscience, in fads, and in generally in unmasking cultural delusion. So um, this is hot, producible uh, material today. It's interesting to audiences who are grappling with the long history of gender roles, inequalities, and gender fluidity as well as the current plague we are enduring of pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, and postmodern mysticism. Now, Afra Ben, who was active as a playwright from 1670 until her death in 1689, created enterprising heroines like Helena and Cornelia. Um, these are characters who are critical of gender norms and navigating their way through the stacked deck of sexual relations. But her farce, The Emperor of the Moon, which would go on to be her most performed work in the long 18th century, made its target pseudoscientific credulity underwritten by political motivation. 
Um, Mary Pick's uh, 1700 play, The Bow Defeated, was recently adapted by the RSC as The Fantastic Follies of Mrs. Rich, proving that it has staying power, um, just as Susanna Sontleaf's 1709, The Busybody, her, the most popular comedy written by a woman and the seventh most performed play of the period. Um, Sontleaver also showed an interest in science and wrote a fantastic female scientist in the character of Valeria in the Bassett table, though that plays real expose as compulsive gambling. Um, later, and, and women aren't as active in the middle of the 18th century, but by the 1770s, Hannah Cowley will turn the satiric gaze on proto-Orientalism and also ballooning a, a great fad in the late 18th century in A Day in Turkey. And that's a theme that Inchbald picks up on in a mogul tale. Uh, women finished the century box office strong and took on social questions of justice and manipulation, though few did so as directly as Inchbald did. In short, there's a legacy of commercially successful, critical, and brilliant women leading up to Inchbald that make her successes possible. Um, she began as a working actress who had to overcome a stutter to have a career before turning primarily to playwriting after the death of her husband, Joseph. Um, she never remarried and instead ensured her independence by being the hardest woman, hardest working woman in 18th century show, showbiz. Um, she cranked out not only 23 plays, but also took a grueling commission from Longman to provide 125 introductions to individual plays in the remarks for the British theater, which she did from 1806 to 1809. While most playwrights died in relative poverty as artists are wont to do, Inchbald, through her incredible talent and her work ethic, as well as a very disciplined approach to investing, supported her extended family and gave to various charities until she died just shy of her 68th birthday in 1821. Uh, for more on Inchbald and the particulars of animal magnetism, a play about both pretending and believing, I turn to my colleague, Paula Backscheider. Paula, thank you. Thank you, Misty. You, you contextualized animal magnetism with both ends of her life, so thanks. Animal Magnetism is a short play translated and adapted for the English stage from the French playwright Dumaniant called The Doctor in Spite of Everyone. I'm gonna translate the French stuff, my pronunciation is horrid. Dumaniant, Antoine Jean André Borlin, had joined the Palace Royal three years earlier and his open war or ruse upon ruse had been a huge hit. Inchball had transformed that successfully into the very popular The Midnight Hour and both Dumaniant's and her plays are still revived now and then on the French and English stages. Dumaniant is today compared to Beaumarchais, but not nearly as well known. In London, theater goers were talking through or even not arriving to see main pieces. And Covent Garden, Inchball's theater, was making the evening program two or three short farces, pantomimes and musicals. No main piece at all. The need for these shorter entertaining pieces was insatiable. Both London theaters had hired a French entrepreneurial performer, Le Texier, to bring them French plays suitable for translation and performance. He and Thomas Harris, the theater merit, um, manager, brought what would be animal magnetism to Elizabeth Anchbal to English, her second Dumaniant play. Um, uh, one of her playwright friends said that she was very, very free when she Englished one of the plays brought to her in French. So in many ways, this is really an Anchbal play. Um, she had the script ready in only 16 days. As she, and that was translation and writing the script. As she worked on her plays, she covered her mirrors to avoid distraction and composed with intense concentration and collaboration. The play went immediately into rehearsal and she attended the first reading, a rehearsal and several performances. 
because she was an actress, noticed that she had unusual access to the preparation and rehearsal of the play. Um, the audience would have known something about Texier. He was a sensational career reading popular plays, taking all of the parts. He even performed before the French King. He moved to London to do the same, and many in the audience would have been familiar with animal magnetism, as Texier had performed it frequently at his specially built London performance space. Of course, he did all the parts. Inchball was well prepared to make it a success. Her 1787 main piece, Such Things Are, had been a huge success, and its portrayal of the great prison reformer, John Howard, made it its news commentary and generated widespread provincial productions. She was at the beginning of the peak of a brilliant, daring career. She was, for instance, the only playwright allowed to have a character speak dangerous lines, recognizing the food shortages that were sparking riots, as one of her characters says repeatedly, provisions are so scarce. She was really known for her, um, her timeliness, her taking on, um, I guess, controversial topical events. Such things are as a portrait of John Howard and prison reform, of course, just as it is today, was always controversial. In fact, all of her plays benefit from her experience as an actress and have topical appeal and often subversive elements. Her first play had exploited the passionate interest in balloon travel, as, um, as Misty said. And Animal Magnetism was also about a scientific fad, Anton Mesmer's pseudo-medical treatments with mesmerism and hypnosis. Although exposed as a con by then, hypnotism and mesmerism were still being practiced and produced more quack medicine. The play is timely for us, for the COVID pandem pandemic is still infested with pseudoscientific, even dangerous treatments and, um, and other things. And of course, hypnotism still has believers today. The first reviews of Animal Magnetism noted that the house was full to the extreme, even the first night, and the play, quote, honored with universal applause. Many of the reviews take up the quack science. The world described reactions to the play's pseudoscience scenes as striking and forcible and very laughable. Some reviews admonished differently. The European magazine said the play was intended to ridicule the absurd practice endeavored to impose on the public. It identified electric beds as treatments for infertility as the turn this imposture has taken in England. Another referred to the pretended somnambulism of the magnetic art is associated with tickling diseased hypochondriacs and dreaming old women into irrational visions. So in other words, the reviews were taking on the uh, task of helping to illuminate the public about this being a fraud. Another advantage was that Inchball was still acting in such plays and she knew she was writing for the company with the great comedian John Quick for the doctor and a longtime friend and serviceable actress, Becky Wells as Constance. In fact, Lisette, as you will see, as the better of the women's parts. While Wells sometimes resented Inchball's interpretations of parts in her own plays, Isabella Maddox had an impressive repertory of roles and excelled in polished, fashionable comic parts created by Inchball, Cooley, and Sheridan. The play assembles audience favorite devices, secret letters, disguises, an imprisoned ingenue, a servant, and his noble master changing places. Um, sometimes Inchbal worked with the actresses as she has with Mac Maddox. And of course she had frequent teas and conversations with, um, with Wells. So there was a very active collaboration here that included Texier and the actresses. Animal magnetism was frequently performed into the 19th century. Harris used it for a striking important innovation 
He paired it with Inchbald's Midnight Hour and with Francis Brooks' Beautiful Rosina. Evenings made up of only women's plays became a regular practice. And this was new and soon it was taken up by Drury Lane. Inchbald was brilliant, determined, and would be the author of 19 plays produced on the London stage. In the 1788-89 season, when Animal Magnetism debuted, an astonishing six of her plays were in performance. So that is an introduction to one of the most active and successful um, women playwrights of the time. And now what we've all been waiting for, Hadiana is going to give us a performance. Uh, oh, I am muted. Thank you, Paula. Um, if I could have the actors just come on video for a moment so we can put faces to names, I will introduce you all. Hello, hello. Wonderful. All right. Alicia Espinoza, who's reading for Lisette, is a Boricua actor, writer, theater maker based in New York City. She's a 2022 Audrey resident at New George's and an artist in residence at the Latinx Playwrights Circle. Her plays have been developed and or presented at La Tea, Primary Stages, The Drama League, Pace University, Club Thumb, and Step One Theater Project. A selection of her work can be found on the New Play Exchange Network. Select acting credits include Blooms at EST, A Skeptic and a Bruja at Urbanite, Seize the King at Classical Theater of Harlem, Our Dear Dead Drug Lord at Women's or WP Theater, Alma at the Old Globe, Hamlet at Stage One, Shakespeare the Remix, Capital Rep, Much Ado About Nothing at Kentucky Shakespeare. You can read more about Alicia and her work at aliciaespinoza.com, M-F-A-U-M-K-C. Next, we have Norea Kang, who's reading for Constance. Norea is a classically trained Korean-American actor based in New York, Seattle, and the Sacramento Bay Area. Regional credits include The Chinese Lady at the Denver Center, and So That Happened at Fifth Avenue Theater, White Pearl at the Studio Theater, Caught at Intamin Theater, The Hard Problem, A Christmas Carol, and John at American Conservatory Theater, the Tempest at Livermore Shakespeare Festival, and in New York, her credits include Madonna Cole Bambino at Ars Nova in the New Ohio, Salty at Lyra Theater, and TV includes Law and Order SVU, Betty uh, at HBO, MFA American Conservatory Theater, and next up, the world premiere of Lloyd Says the Heart Sellers at Milwaukee Repertory Theater. You can read more about Norea at noreakang.com. Next, we have Ned Avril Snell, who's reading for The Doctor. Ned has appeared in Florida at Job Site Theater, in Henry V, here, and Gloucester Blue. Orlando Shakes include Henry IV, Part Two, Stageworks Theater. He's been in 12 Angry Men, The Lifespan of a Fact, and at Tampa Rep, Every Brilliant Thing, A View from the Bridge, and The Iceman Cometh. An American stage company, Ned has performed in Tartuffe and A Moon for the Misbegotten. The Oslo State Theater's Dog Day series, he performed What the Butler Saw, and at various theaters in the solo play, The Apoc... I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Rent Ned, Apocrypha of Theodore. Roosevelt, oh, Apocrypha of Theodore Roosevelt. And regionally at Indiana Rep, uh, and the United Solo Festival in New York. He's the author of the Florida set mystery novel, Small Professional Murder, that's available on Amazon, and appeared in the films Waiting on Mary, The Bedford Devil, and The Breton and the Muse, and A Midnight in Paris. Finally, we have Ryan Meyer, who's reading for Jeffrey. Ryan is a theater and film actor from the San Francisco Bay Area, now based in New York City. Ryan often collaborates with writers on plays and workshops, staged readings, and other developmental phases, including at Rattlestick, The Flea, The Pit, Dixon Place, and The Lark. Well, the now defunct Lark. Recent theater productions or showings include Murder on the Orient Express, Cape Playhouse, John Bonet the Musical, The Pitch, Dixon Place, The Pit, South Bend Love Story at The Pit, and short film 1781, Come At Me Bro. BFA, NYU Tisch, Atlantic Theater Company, and Experimental Theater Wing, and you can read more about him at ryanmeyer.com. All right, I'm going to go um, off video. Um, if just, I think everyone is off video, but just in case 
you're not folks in the audience, please turn your videos off and mute yourself. Uh, you can also click on this little uh, square rectangle in your top right corner that says view. And if you could click um, hide non-video participants, if it's not already set that way, it should be, because I'm looking at mine, it looks like it's already there. Um, and actors can, uh, actors who were not on stage for the top of the scene, please go off video. Thank you. I overheard it all. And he has given your guardian the wand in which you heard him say the magnet was contained. And while he keeps it, it is to magnetize you and force you to love him in spite of yourself. All this agrees with the letter he has given me from his master, in which the Marquis informs me by what accident that letter my guardian sent to the doctor who professes magnetism fell into his hands and immediately gave him the idea of disguising his valet and sending him hither under the name of that doctor. But where is Lafleur now? Just left your guardian and gone home to bring the patient you heard him speak of. And I would lay a wager that very patient is no other than the Marquis himself. Before what end is all this? That they have planned, you may depend upon it. For the present, you have nothing to do but to pretend an affection for your guardian. It will be difficult to feign a passion my heart revolts at. Never fear your good acting. Besides, I will take equal share in it. How? You? I'll fall in love with the doctor as well as you. If the magnetism affects you, why not have the same power over me? And if it makes you love him, it shall make me adore him. <laughs> Hush, here he comes. What he has told seems so very surprising that nothing but proofs can thoroughly convince me. And now for the proof. He ogles you, cast a tender look, and accompany it with a sigh. Oh, <sighs> alas. Oh, my dear Constance, my lovely ward, what, what makes you sigh? Weariness of your confinement, I suppose. Oh, sir. <sighs> Oh, oh, come, come. I, I confess the restraint you've been under has been too much, and I'm not surprised that you've taken a dislike to me. A dislike to you? Oh, sir. Oh, oh, guardian. I believe it will do. Uh, come, come, Constance, do not sigh and make yourself uneasy. You shall not live many weeks thus retired, for... I am thinking of marrying you very soon to a fine young gentleman. Oh, oh cruel. What did you say? Uh, if I have the good fortune to be beloved by you, let me have the happiness to hear it from yourself. Yes, cruel man. Some invincible power compelled me in spite of my resistance. Yes, I love you. Oh. And I adore you. What? You too? I did not expect that. Not merely a love, but a violence. I don't to distraction. Love you to the joss of my health, of spirits, of rest, and life. If you do not take pity on the passion which burns in my heart, regardless of the flames which consume me with violence, can you be insensible of my tender pleadings? Care how you turn my affection to hatred. What a terrible situation I've got myself into. The effects of magnetism is very natural. It works as well on one as another. But Lisette's love is very troublesome. I'll call Jeffrey and, and give part of my power to him. He will take the wand for a few minutes and charm Lisette. Why do you thus run from me? Is this a return my love demands? But be not uneasy. Death shall deliver you from an object whose passion you despise. Oh, that you could but read what is written in my heart. Ah, oh, sir, the whole the state to which you have reduced a poor innocent. If I am treated with kindness, I am 
naturally soft, gentle, and tender. But if I am neglected by all that's great and precious, I will do some strange thing either to you or I will. This Lisette is so furious that she makes me tremble. I must put an end to her affection. Jeffrey! Here, sir. And what do you want with me? Take this wand and carry it to my study. Yes, sir. Directly. Oh, stop a moment, Jeffrey. Stop a moment. Oh, two or three moments, if, if you please. Now we shall see what effect it has. I see through this design. Let us fall in love with Jeffrey. With all my heart. Oh. Well, Jeffrey, and um, how do you do, Jeffrey? Pretty well, considering my leg where the dog bit me, and considering I can only see with one eye. <laughs> but even that misfortune does not prevent your looking very agreeable, Jeffrey. It succeeds. She's taken. Who can resist that? Amiable figure, dearest Jeffrey. <laughs> this is as bad as the other. I think the mad dog has bit us all. Is it possible you can love Jeffrey? No, no. Your situation forbids it. Take, take my master. I resign him to you. No, I resign him to you. I not have him. It's, it's a very disagreeable situation. Death to my passion. Yes, I'm sure he will prefer me. No, I won't. I have been in love with her this 12 months, and I'll make choice of her. Then what will become of me? I can bear this no longer. You give me that, and you go make up some medicines. <sighs> My dear Lisette, you have made me so happy. I must shake hands. Oh! Learn to behave with more reserve for the future. God! You have not behaved with much reserve. Did you not hang upon me and said you loved me? Love you? Oh, my master. Do not imagine I can love any but him. No. Who can love any but him? This is worse and worse. Where's the doctor? If he does not come and give me some relief, I'm a ruined man. Woo. Very nice read, y'all. Misty, Paula, are you returning with us? Here's every we are back. I was doing my uh, applause by icon. Delicious. <laughs> it was just I such fun. Such fun. I don't have the power to return. The host. Oh, there. She just turned me on. Yeah. You know, it occurred to me before we, I want to hear what the actors have to say about what they just did and to to address any questions that they might have but it occurred to me that some of the folks in our audience are not very familiar with this play and what the general plot is uh this scene kind of takes up uh at a certain point maybe we could fill in what the plot line is here a little bit mm -hmm. is that a good idea yeah and tatiana do you want to do that or i'm happy to do that what um, sure, I'm happy to jump in. So this is the top of act two and Misty, please jump in if I'm leaving anything important out. Um, Constance is the ward to the doctor. The doctor is her guardian. Uh, she's just come of age. She says that she is 18 and the doctor is in his seventies. Uh, he intends to marry her as I've learned was uh, the custom at the time. Jeffrey uh, works for the doctor, is his assistant, but the doctor has also been experimenting on him, hence the eye. Um, and Constance does not want to marry the doctor. We learn in- Can I jump one. in for just a second? Yes, please, Paula. 
there's this favorite scene of mine that is begins the play. Constance is already in love with a marquee. And of course, Lizette is in love with his servant. And so the marquee has been trying to get her a letter and trying to get a letter to between the lovers is always a big part of these comedies. And so um, Constance is, is stumped, but Lisette says, don't worry, we'll just write the answer right now. And she said, how can we write an answer to a letter we don't have? And she said, oh, it, we'll do it. And so she writes the letter. And so when the Marquis finally is able to deliver his letter, he can, his servant receives the letter instantly. And so that's the kind of managing that Lisette does and the way she anticipates the formulaic comedy moments in the play. This play was hilarious. People, everything you read about it at the time is that people laughed all the way through. And so that scene that begins with Lisette writing the letter in advance to help Constance just sets the tone and in a way a configuration of the women characters. I hope that was okay. Yes, it was fabulous. We've had so much fun and I kept saying to the actors, I'm sorry you can't hear how much I'm laughing because I keep going off video and mute myself, but it's so funny every time we get to rehearse it. Um, yeah, I was very, I picked this part of the play because it's so active. Um, I thought it would be great fun for the actors to dive into the meat of this wand and the power and magic. And uh, something I didn't mention before is that the doctor um, is has not been granted a diploma, right? So he, he's been killing his patients and finds um, magnetism, they say earlier in the play, discovers magnetism and is interested in it because it is the enemy of the medical community because it's this other community that he thinks he can um, get in with so that is and of course the marquis and his valet lafleur who these women are in love with seem to intercept the doctor's connection with these magnetists and they pretend to be magnetists and that is how at the beginning of this scene we've just seen how our doctor gets this wand. Um, so it's all a big uh, a big joke being played on the doctor that the women are in, in on, that these two other men, the Marquis and Lafleur, are in on. And, and that's been great fun to kind of craft in rehearsal how to um, make that clear. And I'm, I'm curious if it was clear. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll, I'll jump in and say, yes, incredibly clear. And, you know, I mean, Dickens, uh, Dickens company, Charles Dickens company did this play a few times. I mean, it, it did persist well into the 19th century. And he's got that great line where he says, I've seen people laugh at this piece so much that until they hung over the front of the boxes, like ripe fruit. Right. Um, and what you all managed to do um, in a Zoom medium is get that sense of interplay, right? We've got a lot of levels of knowledge here, and, and that's often the case, but this farce, you know, which is running at like, you know, 120 RPMs involves sort of a lot of awareness. And Naria and Alicia, I loved what you were doing um, in this imperfect medium to signal that it was really, it's really effective. Um, just like the great sort of spoon gag, right? Passing it through the camera. Um, but there's, there is so much physical comedy that when, um, we were talking about doing this on zoom, one of the, the things that I expressed to Tatiana is like, wow, yeah. How are you going to get how are you going to get that feel? And I just want to commend you all um, for uh, for capturing that for us in this little bit that really did stand, you know, on its own. And then, and I'm I'm glad that we unpacked the plot a little bit too. But certainly, um, the doctor is this figure of kind of both bad male knowledge um, and a kind of popularized science that's very susceptible to somebody like Mesmer who had already been discredited in Paris, but he's doing his London tour, you know, and trying to um, sell more magical cures. There's a lot of stuff about the, about animal magnetism or this, this idea of a kind of vitalism um, that always had sexual connotations and 
tended to work. I mean, there were followers, there were people who paid for these cures. Um, Paul and I were talking about the infamous um, uh, electric bed or magnetic bed, right? Um, and cures for uh, infertility, but also obviously um, impotence. And so the wand, you know, is just one of those jokes. It li- it's right on the surface. Um, yeah, this scene was perfect because it brought the configuration and what the characters wanted and were willing to do a lot of, um, you know, ridiculous, spectacular things to do. So it was really a perfect scene to open, open a discussion of it. There was actually an electric bed that you could rent for the night for 50 pounds in Covent Garden. And so um, electric beds were big. I've seen advertisements for them in, in um, late 18th century mm-hmm. newspapers. That's true. I, I, I love the way that you ran the scene and we're going to ask you to run it again. And before we get there, I would like to hear from um, any of the actors or Tatiana about what you would like to know that you can bring to that scene the second time around. Do you have any any sort of questions or the why would I be doing this kind of <laughs> kind of reflections? You know, Tatiana, we were talking about this relationship to Jack Bree um, and how it seems written that it's a foregone conclusion that if Constance marries the doctor, then Lisette must marry Jack Bree, if I read it correctly. Is there like a, is that just for the sake of comedy or is there some sort of historical reason that would have naturally followed or is it just for the sake of the joke? Most of the time, um, the servants get married. Usually they've kind of been in love, maybe even more than the leading characters. Um, It's interesting that Jeffrey gets a lot of comment in the reviews. And of course, it's the Marquis servant that Lisette wants. Um, the comments about Jeffrey in the reviews suggest that uh, he's he's a very popular character because he was played by a very good actor. But um, one of them, only one, mentions that he's a parallel to the captive women, and of course. The doctor's been experimenting on him. Um, He's getting ready when he's interrupted to do something with hot oil to Jeffrey. I have a lot of trouble with Jeffrey. I'm not really into cruelty, but they thought that Jeffrey was very, very funny. But the reviews do comment on him not playing the part of an ordinary servant. And I think that this is one of, of Inchball's kind of subversive tricks. She often, like look at Lisette, um, her servants are unusually intelligent and have unusual agency and um, ability to make things happen. And um, so the more you unpack Jeffrey, you see that that he lays things bare, but he also has a lot of those sub- subversive servant qualities. Um, I think this is a case, it's, it's not quite true in Demoniant's play. And I think this is one of the places where she was very free with the script, like her playwright friends were saying. What did you all really think of Jeffrey? I mean, one of you was acting him. Yeah, they first refer to Jeffrey, at, despite him also being in, um, you know, such a, a lower class position, as would, you know, he's more on their level but they refer to him as their jailer firstly um, because he is so loyal to his master which ends up being you know his like class traitorship almost ends up being his like um his own demise here he takes so much abuse (laughs) Yeah, his body is literally controlled by the doctor. Um, 
and, and that's true, but then he enforces his power over the women. I mean, this play is, this scene is so much about power and who has it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Which actually brings up a question for me. And we were discussing the guardian ward relationship. And I'm curious about historically, would Con is Constance the ward to the doctor because she's an orphan? And does she have money? I was curious about that kind of dynamic of the power struggle between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking about this a little bit um, earlier. You know, it's a legal relation primarily, but it signals her, one of the first things it signals is her money, right? She wouldn't, she wouldn't have um, she, she wouldn't be in this position and she wouldn't be guarded in this way if she didn't have wealth. And that's another way into the question of the servants and their sexuality and whether they marry or not. I mean, we're still looking at a model of marriage in which um, there's more of the merger to it than uh, perhaps than, than the love match. Those certainly ideas of companionate marriage had, had more traction. So, um, you know, he's a guardian of her wealth, but that also means of her person. And for women who could not make, who could not make many kinds of contracts in this culture, right, couldn't negotiate um, much, the, the one contract women could make and were expected to make was, was marriage, but their agency evaporates as soon as they do it, right? So here we get to extend that state um, and it is, you know, as Inchbald and many other playwrights, but especially women playwrights understood this moment of potential to have a lot of comic energy. Um, comedy and anxiety are always good friends, right? You know, um, you need that, that anxiety, if you can direct it into the laugh, um, is quite powerful. And I think that that also is another way to think about poor Jeffrey, right? Um, when as we, some of us who were at the Oxford Symposium had the pleasure of talking about this play and thinking about a, him as a kind of Baldrick figure from Blackadder, um, but also he's the body in pain, right? The first thing we find out about him is that his master's just put out his good eye to save the other one, right? Um, so you have to be willing to joke about that. And Paula, yeah, you know, I'm not that cruel either, although maybe I am because I, I was at least willing to laugh at that, right? But it's an extreme sense of what is wrong with this picture, which is also Jeffrey's loyalty. And this is not a master worth being loyal to. And, Doesn't and Jeffrey escape at the end? Doesn't he take his key and go? Well, yeah, he after he gives them the keys, right? Um, but you know, he could be free. That's the thing. I mean, he's not. He, he's he's. I, he, yeah, I, I, he does. He does kind of get out of this. But um, yeah, yeah. So I think I think uh, Inchwell liberates him. But going with guardians, it's interesting. Women novelists and playwrights tended to give the the ingenue a pair of guardians. And one of them is usually very mercenary and maybe a, comes from a business background. And the other is an aristocrat. So what all of these women playwrights and novelists are doing is reenacting a very real conflict of values, not just monetary, but of the place of women and women in society in these configurations. Um, I think that Jeffrey is so funny because there's so much personality to that actor and that comes through. Remember that they knew, the audience knew all kinds of personal stuff about the actors and actresses and they'd seen them in a configuration of plays. So one of the things, I used to work for a prisoner in, in Indiana and one thing prisoners would say is that they had seen so many people shot on television, they didn't realize how messy and permanent it was. Well, when they see Jeffrey having sacrificed an eye and now he's threatening a leg and hot oil, they know that this comic actor does that sort of thing all the kind, time and plays. And it, in some ways it's not real. And that mm -hmm. for them, it's hilariously funny because this actor has done a repertory of maimed characters 
that came out okay. Does that make sense to you, Misty? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, we had models of this before. Other um, actors with disabilities, um, you know, most famously Samuel Foote, also a playwright, right, who wrote parts for himself with his, you know, sort of it, he he lost a leg. And so he turned this into comedy and made fun of other disabled people. <laughs> well, and one, one rival in particular who also didn't have legs. So it's a level of comfort with that kind of joking. Um, but this also seems like a good time to point out, we've got some incredible folks here in the Zoom who might have thoughts as well. And we really do want this to be crowdsourced. So if you, if you are out there, and I won't call any of you by name and have thoughts, um, just pop the hand up, I think. Yeah. Misty, I think we were going to do that after the... Oh, after the, after the second yeah. scene. Okay. So don't worry, guys. You're, you're going to get Great. a chance. I wanted to mention something, though, about the, the sort of cruelty uh, uh, that's inflicted on Jeffrey. And remember, this is the, the, the birth of clowning um, at the, during this period on the British stage. Grimaldi is performing the um uh, and so much of his uh clowning performance involved um the, you know physical pain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the the sort of contortions and tricks that he did involve sort of physical pain so that's another sort of context for um for why jeffrey would have been mm -hmm. uh, a popular character he was sort of associated with um, with the sort of iconic figure, well, to become iconic figure of the clown. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such a good point, Christina. And before Grimaldi and before Jeffrey is Harlequin um, and the Harlequinades in which dismemberment, right, is a standard joke. That was done with puppets and, and puppet parts for the most part. But um, the, um, the, comedia, uh, the comedia invention that leads to the run of Harlequinades, um, especially on the 18th century stage, starting in the 1720s, included all kinds of just like, you know, ha ha, isn't it funny? Um, Harlequin's been chopped up into pieces or torn apart. So um, that uh, that provides a little context too, I think. Yeah. I have one more quick question before we um, dive into a second read. I'm curious, so when I, working on this play with the these fantastic actors and reading it and not having known this play or Inchbald before I came to this work, it really struck me how incredibly feminist in terms of like our modern concept of feminist, of giving women agency, it really struck me that this play really does, um, even though, as you pointed out, Misty, they're in this, these uh, guardian ward, like Constance's award and Lisette is a servant and yet, within this power structure, right? She gives them so much agency. And I'm just curious, I mean, it sounds like the play was incredibly popular, but I'm curious how that was received, especially in, in painting the guardian ward relationship in such a really painting the doctor as this villain and the women as pulling the wool over his eyes. Was that received positively? Yes. yes. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the guardian took over in the role of father, banker, lawyer. And um, they were often misfits, but um, Inchball was an absolute genius at creating feminist characters. She has a play, um, Wives As They Were. Um, Aids As They Aids Are. As they are. <laughs> yes, and uh, I think Danny O'Quinn was here and he has an absolutely brilliant article on that, but even, um, Lady Placid, um, she's kidnapped by a man who intends to seduce or rape her, and she manages to completely um, make him powerless by knitting. She sits there knitting while he threatens her, and that play is just filled it. Uh, Danny also has this fabulous quotation about the most impressive thing that Inchball did in her personal life, and um, and that's what she gave her characters. Danny, do you remember that? It's something about what she did with her money and her freedom. Are you still here? Well, wait. We can, we'll, we'll put him on the spot after the second round, maybe. Okay. While well, he reads his own writing. 
<laughs> or I reread it so I can quote it. But he, so he points out that the most impressive thing Inchbald did was maintain her independence and her dignity and her reputation. She turned down um, the greatest thinkers and actors of the time. She turned down Kimball. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to remember too, Tatiana, that women are a very important part of the 18th century audience. Yes. Um, and don't think for a minute that playwrights didn't write to certain parts of the audience. Um, you know, there, there are plays that are clearly being written to the footman's gallery where mm -hmm. all the servants sat. Um, there, you know, there are plays I think Inchbalds really do appeal to women who were hungry uh, to see empowered representations of themselves mm -hmm. on the stage. Mm -hmm. And as the theater, as theater goes on, the theaters themselves get much larger. Um, so you do have some class diversity, but you've also got to play your physical comedy because of the spatial realities. It's a bigger house. Not everybody can hear as much dialogue. And so what you'll see is for those of you who've read, you know, Way of the World or Man of Mode, right? Much earlier, um, there's a verbal density there that um, is harder to convey when you've got a 3000 seat house, no electricity, no amplification. Um, but uh, the guardian dynamic, right? And the question of the proto-feminism um, uh, or the feminism really of some of her plays. I mean, you know, Inchbald and, um, and Mary Wollstonecraft were friends up to a point, they had a break. Um, but, uh, you know, something like the busybody, which is much more, which is much lighter and more farcical, um, makes a big joke about the guardian calling his ward chargey, right? His charge. He wants to baby talk with her and she calls him guardy. And that becomes a sort of comic pivot because we know it's gross, right? This gross baby talk, uck. Um, and Miranda can kind of signal that, but still kind of play along. So you get a lot of performance of the script of the power relation as a form of comic critique, right? Oh yeah, I'm gonna show you what that's like. I'm gonna be your good little chargey. Um, and that plays well, but it also lets us know, yeah, playing to the women in the audience, but also shifting um, uh, shifting attitudes. Yeah. Yeah. And look what Norea did with, am I pronouncing your name right? Um, anyway, notice how they may be making feminist statements and playing feminist jokes on an older patriarchal man, but they want something that moves them into a happy marriage, into mm -hmm. a domestic place. And so there's something of, of you know, that the way Jameson talks about you ex exercise a fantasy and you exercise this kind of free behavior, but then at the end that is contained and you've seen the treasure, but it's, it's repurposed in ways that make everybody happy. So I think Inchbal is really good at that, but she gives you a very strong image. And, and I thought Nuria did a really good job conveying that everything she and Lizette were doing really had had good aims that you know who's going to say we don't want a happy marriage here so uh tatiana is there any any direction you want to um give your crew here before ah. before us we go away here and let you do your thing yeah so i was really struck um by misty's uh comment that uh, Nerea uh, Constance is in this really powerful position, actually, as not yet being promised to anyone. And I wonder, just for fun um, actors, if we could play on that. Um, Nerea, this time around for fun, let's shift Constance, Constance just a bit to really step into her power a bit more. I think that we can make her just a little bit more aware that she is in a position of power, right? Knowing that the doctor wants her and knowing that she's not yet been promised to anyone. Um, so let's see what that does. And Ned, um, I don't see you, but I think you're here somewhere. Um, is Ned still here? I'm here. I'm here. Yes. Okay. okay, good. Sorry. <laughs> um, Ned, I wonder, 
in response to that, if the doctor, if we could just up a little bit more of the doctor's desperation for Constance. Sure. And those, those couple lines that we worked on, right, where the spoon comes down and he's actually honestly, earnestly asking if he loves her. And then there's another line a little bit further into the scene where she she threatens killing herself. Yeah. I think that also could be an opportunity perhaps to let a little bit more of that want and desire and desperation for her to come in. Sure. Super. Awesome. Thank you all. Let's go again. I overheard it all. And he has given your guardian the wand in which you heard him say the magnet was contained. And while he keeps it, it is to magnetize you and force you to love him in spite of yourself. All this agrees with the letter he has given me from his master, in which the Marquis informs me by what accident that letter my guardian sent to the doctor who professes magnetism fell into his hands and immediately gave him the idea of disguising his valet and sending him hither under the name of that doctor. <laughs> Where is it for now? Just <laughs> left your guardian and gone home to bring the patient you heard him speak of. And I would lay a wager. That very patient is no other than the Marquis himself. But for what end is all this? That they have planned, you may depend on it. For the present, you have nothing to do but pretend an affection for your guardian. Mm. It will be difficult to feign a passion my heart revolts at. Never fear your good acting. Besides, I will take equal share in it. How? You? I'll fall in love with the doctor as well as you. If the magnetism affects you, why not have the same power over me? And if it makes you love him, it shall make me adore him. <laughs> Hush, here he comes. What he has told seems so very surprising that nothing but proof can thoroughly convince me. And now for the proof. He ogles you, cast a tender look and accompany it with a sigh. Oh. Alas. My dear Constance, my lovely ward, what, what makes you sigh? Weariness of your confinement, I suppose. Oh, sir. Oh. Oh, come, come. I, I confess the restraint you've been under has been too much, and I'm not surprised that you've taken a dislike to me a dislike to you. Oh, sir. Oh. oh, guardian. I believe it will do. Come, come, Constance. Do not sigh and make yourself uneasy. You shall not live many weeks thus retired, for I am thinking of marrying you to a nice young gentleman. Oh, true. What did you say? Or if I have the good fortune to be beloved by you, let me have the happiness to, to hear from you myself. Yes, cruel man. Some invincible power compels me in spite of my resistance. Yes, I love you. Oh. And I adore you. What? You too? I did not expect that. Mine is not merely a love. What a rage. A violence, I dote to distraction, love you to the joss of my health, of spirits, of rest and life. If you do not take pity on the passion which burns in my heart, be regardless of the flames which consume me with violence. Can you be insensible of my tender pleading? Take care how you turn my affection to hatred. What a terrible situation I've got myself into. The effects of the magnetism is very natural. It acts upon one as well as another. But Lisette's love is very troublesome. I'll call in Jeffrey and give up part of my power to him. He'll take the wand and he'll work for a few minutes to charm Lisette. Why do you thus run from me? Is this a return my love demands? 
But be not uneasy. Death shall deliver you from an object whose passion you despise. Oh, but that you could but read what is written in my heart. Ah, sir, behold the state to which you have reduced a poor innocent. If I am treated with kindness, I am naturally soft, gentle, and tender. But if I am neglected by all that's great and precious, I will do some strange thing, either to you or my rival. This Lisette is so furious that she makes me tremble. I must put an end to her affection. Jeffrey! Here, sir. What do you want with me? Take this and carry it to my study. Yes, sir, directly. Oh, oh stop a moment, Jeffrey. Stop a moment. Two or three moments, if you please. Now we'll see what an effect it has. I see through this design. Let us fall in love with Jeffrey. With all my heart. Oh. Well, Jeffrey. And, uh, and, uh, how do you do, Jeffrey? Oh, pretty well, considering my leg where the dog bit me, and considering I can only see with one eye. But even that was... Fortune does not prevent your looking very agreeable, Jeffrey. It succeeds. She's taken. Who can resist that amiable figure, dearest Jeffrey? <laughs> this is as bad as the other. I think the mad dog has bit us all. Is it possible you can love Jeffrey? No, no. Your situation forbids it. Take, take my master. I resign him to you. No, I resign him to you. I will not have him. This is a very disagreeable situation. Jeffrey, will you be deaf to my passion? Yes, I'm sure he will prefer me. No, I won't. I have been in love with her this 12 months, and I'll make choice of her. Then what will become of me? Oh, I can bear this no longer. Give me that. And you go make up some medicines. <sighs> My dear Lisette, uh, you have made me so happy. <laughs> I must shake hands. Oh! Learn to behave with more reserve for the future. My God! I think you have not behaved with much reserve. Did you not hang upon me and said you loved me? Love you? <laughs> Behold my master, and do not imagine I can love anyone but him. No, who can love any but him? This is worse and worse. Where's the doctor? If he does not come and give me some relief, I am a ruined man. Ooh, very nice. Nice, very, very nice. Thank you all. Um, before, whoops. Before I forget, I want to thank Virginia Tips for running the tech for us. And Virginia, if you can bring people, everybody in the room uh, present before us, um, this is our chance to comment on the performance to, uh, I know there's some scholarly knowledge in the room that goes beyond Paula and Misty. I'm still invisible technically. I have to be turned on. Virginia's working on it, I think, Paula. Okay, there, there you go, good. As we're coming back into the room, ah, I'm seeing people, um, please raise your, your Zoom or your real hand uh, if you have a comment or a question, uh, and, or you can use the chat, whatever you would prefer. And by the way, bravo. Virginia, are you still bringing people in? Yeah, so it looks like everybody is in.
Ah, there's Wendy, yeah. Folks will turn their cameras on. That would be great. Sorry, I have a cat's tail in the screen here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have a question for the actors. As well as being lovesick, which is kind of modern, another thing Guardians often wanted was the money. So um, I'm wondering if the doctor could have shown a bit of avarice and, you know, this is where gesture might have really mattered a lot. But sometimes they want the woman's money more than her youth and beauty. Mm. I think Georgina has a hand up. I do. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I thought that was really good the second time because I got the impression, I think it was really good to have a chat about what was what, you know, and uh, I had the feeling that you're all really kind of going for it in terms of what you knew. But what I was going to say is that it is, I mean, it's a really funny and ironic scene because uh, it's, it's kind of a bit Midsummer Night's dreamy in some way. You know that scene where everybody's... You know, but but um, this thing is trying to control people. And obviously what you can't control and what the women are making full, fully uh, obvious is the incontrollability of passion, which is fantastic, really, in terms of comedy, because... Um, well, because it because it is, and and of course it's satire as well. The the thing about satire, what I, which I wanted to say earlier, is that it's it has to be cruel as well, you know. So all that stuff with Jeffrey, who was really charming and and almost in love with his master, which was kind of really sweet to to start off with, you know. And the, before it kind of tips over into oh, you know, I can be a love object too, you know. It was it was very it, you really brought it out the second time and. And I think that's a great thing about uh, investing a bit of, um, you know, historical knowledge in in terms of the mores of, of the time. The other thing I think is is really important is the amount of control that maids tend to have in these plays. You know, not just in British plays, actually, in in French plays as well, yeah, and and Spanish ones. You know, the the lower characters are often you know pushing the the you know the toffs around and. And I think that's a really important thing to get out. But I also think uh, you were talking earlier about Jeffrey. And I wonder if there's a, a kind of uh, a class comment there from Elizabeth Inchbold, you know, about, well, this is what happens if you really invest too much in, 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 a, in obeying, you know, your master. He will do anything to you. You know, they will take complete advantage of you and then they will sack you when you're old, you know. And I, and I do think that there's a, a kind of um, an allusion to what uh, people with with that sort of power and, you know, wanting more through magnetism in this case will do. So it's, it's completely a play about power on lots of different levels. And that thing about starting to break the power through acting love, uh, I think really makes a very good comment about that and brings that out you know anyway i thought it was great thank you second time i loved it are there anybody? <laughs> questions anybody thank you georgina i think that was right on It's very late here. People here are probably, That's you know, nice. having trouble saying That's anything. Like uh, David, <laughs> I see David has a hand up. Uh, hello, hello, hello to everybody. Um, <clears throat> yes, it's really great. And um, when we saw it in Oxford, and uh, the the thing that really struck me, and I'm sure it's true for the actors here as well, is how tightly tight and economic, you know, the you know the writing is, as it's an uncut version. And you know you don't need to throw anything out. There's nothing superfluous. So so I think all of that comes out. I'm still trying to figure out um, what would be the audiences. You know, 
it, whether there would be a knowing audience who said, oh yeah, animal magnetism, we know what that is, you know, steer clear, steer clear, um, or whether there was, or whether there's a degree of um, kind, kind of uncertainty, you know, I wasn't sure whether there was any, any, any thoughts in the room, you know, about that. One, one thing that I do know is that, um, um, you know, the animal magnetism play, Elizabeth Hinch was, seems to come out of um, a much kind of coarser misogynist tradition, which is in the, there in the early 1780s, uh, around female de debating clubs, which are acted out on stage. And, and, and especially with the, uh, the, the um, electrical bed as, as well, because um, um, Coleman has a play about that. And Coleman's a kind of a sponsor of the early um, 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 inch bolt. Um, so, so there's lots of quite complicated things, but she, she moves it forward. You know, that's what's really interesting. But now I think, I'm not sure I know it, it, the, the, so, so those plays are around 1780, 1781, uh, that come out of the electrical bed phenomena. Um, but it seems to me, but I, I don't know, but you know, any ideas here about, uh, is this a knowing audience who um, is saying, ah, oh, yes, you know, we're too smart for that, or, um, you know, are they less <laughs> less confident? Sorry, yeah, that's it. That's what I, wanted to I think ask. that's a wonderful question, and and you know it's interesting because you know I uh, there's a bizarre collection at the Harry Ransom Center in Austin, Texas, which was uh, a collection uh, put together by the magician Harry Houdini, um, wow. and um, it contains all of these newspaper clippings from this period. Um, the advertising uh, the celestial bed yeah. um, and uh, all of these um, sort of entertainments and shows that were kind of happening in various and sundry venues around London in particular. And that's that's got to make you think that, sorry about the cat, um, <laughs> that uh, if, if it's true that some people were you know, knew that Mesmer was a fraud and were mm -hmm. not taking it, you know, at all seriously, there were clearly people who were buying tickets mm -hmm. to these things. Um, yeah. And this is not something that should be terribly on I mean, to us. I mean, a lot of people, great bleach. I mean, you know, the bit of the, the story I do know is that um, uh, his, his electrical bed was in the Adelphi area, which was near the Haymarket. And of course, Coleman gets very, very itchy about, very anxious about somebody drawing away his audience. So there's lots of quite complex social issues going on at that time that I don't, don't understand. But it, by, by 17, yeah. when the play came out, the beds were popping up. There was a Scot named James Grantham who kind of had several, and one of them was in Covent Garden. But I've actually spent a lot of time, and it seems like the attitude toward Mesmer and the whole animal magnetism thing was very much like our own COVID time. You know, there were people who knew that things were cons, and there were mm -hmm. people who continued to believe. There were people who didn't read the newspaper, so they didn't know that Mesmer had been discredited. Um, they knew it was a big joke. Maybe they'd been to Textier's readings where he did all the parts. And so you just got this. Um, I mean, I think you do this in your book, to be honest with David, but there was this kind of group enjoyment. And it was a very different kind and a very different amount of belief or whatever, just scattered all through it. But people were just enjoying the moment. And remember, if you really wanted to impress your girlfriend, you could just buy a few hours with an electric bed. And it might yes. be like people who rush into a motel and drop a quarter in or whatever, and the bed moves for you to massage you or something. Well, I think this play is, is 
I think it was an inspired choice mm -hmm. <laughs> to do animal mm -hmm. magnetism because, um, you know, there are still boys in my undergraduate classes who wonder if they can't hypnotize a girl. So, yeah, yeah. you know, it's a really good question, Dave. And it, it also makes me think. So, I've been working on a new play that is about hysteria. And actually, Alicia has been involved in its development. And in, in doing the research, and I, I really, it came up as I was working on this play, reminded me of this other play in Hysteria, and, and the way that the remnants of history, even when they've been discredited, hang around for a long time, and particularly Hysteria was in the DSM until the 1980s, the 1980s. I mean, that, you know, and so it, in terms of pseudoscience and things that we've, have long been discredited, I, I don't, you know, Misty and, and Paula know the answer to your question much better than I, but it, it, it does raise an interesting question for me around, you know, how, how these remnants of history, even after they've been discredited, right? Even if, even if they've been exposed for, for the ways in which they have tried to control women um, over the course of history, the, it, it takes a long time to really eradicate them from our consciousness. And I'm not even sure it is fully eradicated from our consciousness. <laughs> yeah. And, and I see Laura's hand, but I was just going to say, you know, and in the next room, right? And, yeah. uh, you know, this, this is, no, it's not eradicated from consciousness, but there are popular prints. I don't think, it, I, I'm not sure if Rowlinson did some, you know, that showed this sort of phallic, like, you know, metal rod with a ball on the end of it and um, kind of, you know, tipping up women's skirts. Um, so how much is, is that an, an audience that's in the know? Had everybody seen that print? No, certainly, surely not everybody, but magnetism is the key word, right? And that we can go back to Swift, right? Where magnetism is coming up as a kind of new science, but superstition and what does it really do? And so it's a, it's a word that refers to an actual phenomenon, um, but that was connected to other kinds of pseudoscience about, you know, could you float an entire island over another island? You know, lots of lots of questions about the limits of science. And we just wanna, I think we've, we've collectively come up with the caution that you don't wanna generalize, you know, what did people in the late 18th century think any more than we would want someone 200 years from now to say, oh, well, because of the pillow guy, people in the early 21st century thought, right? You've got a lot of different perspectives circulating. Um, Laura, can we pitch to Laura? She's got her hand. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, actors. You were phenomenal and it was so funny and engaged and wonderful. And thank you. Um, and Tatiana, your direction was super smart and really interesting. And it was just really enjoyable. Um, I wanted to kind of riff a little bit on this idea of magnetism and the agency of actresses. I mean, Paula and Misty have already alluded to the fact that, um, you know, the, the position of the actress was a really complicated thing in the latter half of the 18th century. There were a lot of famous actresses, but there were actresses who were struggling. Um, one of the women who starred in this play, Mary Wells, was a, a celebrity figure, but she was also a notorious figure. So the fact that the two women in the scene are really in control in a lot of ways um, and that they're in control at the beginning of the scene is really very important. Um, and, I, and I think the idea of contemporary re you know, performances of 18th century plays, to think about that link of the sort of paradoxical agency of the actress. I mean, I'm really actually interested in what the actresses have to say about this. I mean, is, is agency and um, female performance still, I mean, is this still a contested question? Um, do actresses always have agency? Are they, do they continue to be objectified? Um, are there echoes here of what's, Taking control on stage, is that important? These are just things that I'm thinking about. I think maybe as we look at this play and like the fact that it's quote unquote lost to the canon, I think that's really for me the struggle as a contemporary actress in terms of what is my agency because 
what I loved about doing this entire experience was I'm very familiar with this restoration form. Like even this joke about the the guardian who wants to marry his ward, but the ward is in love with someone else. So there's a trick. It's always from the perspective canonically right now of the male writers who wrote about the experience of the wooer, of the gentleman who wants to wed the ward instead. So to have the trick be from the, the woman's perspective, um, honestly, it's not something I ever even thought about. So in that sense, I think agency as a contemporary actress is very strange because you end up often playing parts where you are acted upon, but you are not the actor. Um, and how that contributes to objectification and all these other questions. But then I look at a play like this and I'm like, if we produce these in some kind of balance, then I would feel better about doing all of them, but we don't produce them in some sort of balance. I'm, I'm more often, I was just talking to someone about Shakespeare, right? The joke about grad programs is you want a, you want a grad program of actors of seven. You only need three women because there are only ever three female parts in Shakespeare. And then you need four men to do all the other parts, right? That is an alchemy and equity and agency that still exists in graduate training programs. You will always take more men than women because we do not have enough parts for the women. So I went on kind of a rant, so I'm gonna be quiet. <laughs> No, and that's that's actually an incredibly good point. And, and one of the um, um, goals of you know our the R eighteen collective and the work that we've been doing is to uh, bring to people's attention all of these plays that aren't Way of the World or She Stoops to Conquer. I mean, those are good plays, but how many times have we seen them? Um, versus how many times have we seen an Elizabeth Inchbald play or a Susanna Sontleaf play? Um, and there, you know, there's this just massive archive of plays that I think we don't know about because they were um, they were written for the stage. These are playable plays. They need to be embodied. They need to be acted. Uh, they're they're not something that you sit quietly and read and swoon over the language. Um, they're very, very much kind of for the stage. Um, and that's why it's the work of, you know, actors and directors like you guys is just so incredibly important to uncovering these plays because we can put them out into English syllabi and they'll still be kind of boring. They have to be acted. I think that's a great comment. And look what our two, what the court set and conscience did for us today with their, you know, they're in a they're in a little box on the screen, but you could still see gesture and movement. And they had agency and they took over the part. And I, I think one reason I spent so much time reading 18th century views is there were actresses like Maddox. And at other times when there was an actress who could take over a part and do in a way what um, what um, Naria and Alicia did today with their parts. And then you see this and you think, oh yeah, people would still find this play funny and they'd like to see it. And um, Misty has, has been part of staging the Mogul Tale and people really loved it. But as long as we basically are a profession that isn't into performance studies, but reads and says, where's the poetry and um, treats it as though it were fiction until we somehow manage to go to the archive and do what we just saw happen with, with Tatiana's production. Uh, those plays are still gonna stay um, largely unknown. That's probably a place where we ought to end since we're out of time, but I wanna thank our actors, I want to thank our director, I want to thank our scholars, uh, I want to thank everybody in the room. Um, it's been lovely to see you all here and this will be recorded. Um, so tell your friends if they missed it and want to see it, it'll be up on the CAS YouTube channel. Have a good evening, everybody, and thank, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. Great to see you, Kim. <laughs>